Hello and welcome to the uh, 466 uh, clinicians who have joined us for tonight's webinar. The title of the webinar is Working Together to Support a Child uh, with Autism Spectrum Disorder Experiencing Sleep Disturbance. And this webinar is hosted by the Mental Health Professionals Network. My name uh, is Professor Shanta Rajaratnam and I'll be facilitating tonight's session. I'm a psychologist who's based uh, in Melbourne at Monash University uh, and my interest is uh, particularly in the neuroscience of sleep and circadian rhythms uh, and also circadian rhythm sleep disorders and uh, treatment approaches uh, for circadian rhythm sleep disorders. I'm the immediate past president of the Australasian Sleep Association which is the uh, peak body representing researchers and clinicians working in the area of sleep in Australia and New Zealand. And I'm delighted that a number of our panel members are active members of the association also. So uh, I'd like to start by firstly introducing uh, the panel. Uh, uh, we have Alex Bartle with us uh, from New Zealand. Uh, Alex is a GP who now works uh, exclusively in his Sleep Well Clinic, uh, which was designed to offer assessment and treatment uh, for children and adults suffering from sleep disorders such as problematic snoring, sleep apnea, insomnia, and parasomnias. Alex, can you tell us a little bit about how your interest in sleep disorders first came about? Uh, well, Shantha, it's um, interesting that I started about 15 years ago and uh, realizing that so many of my patients had sleep disorders in my general practice and uh, wanting to ex uh, explore that further. And, uh, went on a course in Sydney and it just blew me away that everything that I was doing in my general practice there was some aspect of uh, sleep that uh, could be applied to that. Um, uh, so I, it really grew from there and my interest has not uh, waned since that time. It's a fascinating subject and so important for us all. Well great to have you again on the panel with us tonight uh, Alex. Thank you. So uh, joining us also is uh, Dr. Margot Davey, who's a pediatric sleep physician uh, who's based in Victoria. She's the director of the Melbourne Children's uh, Sleep Centre at Monash Medical Centre. She's well known uh, across the country and internationally for her broad expertise in pediatric sleep medicine. Margot, welcome. It's great to have you with us. Um, can you just tell us a little bit about your centre? How many children uh, does your centre see uh, per year and, and, and what are the most common sleep problems that you, you see? Um, well, our centre sees all children in terms of anything to do with sleep, too much, too little or interrupted. In terms of the sleep laboratory, we study uh, about a thousand children a year. In terms of coming in for a clinical appointment, we probably see between three and four thousand children. And I, I think probably half parents would have concerns about children's breathing and then the other half would be difficulties with sleep onset or waking um, or difficulties with um, uh, unusual wakings or rhythm problems. Great, well welcome uh, Margot. We're delighted to have also with us uh, Amanda Richdale who's a psychologist and a leading researcher uh, in autism spectrum disorders, uh, learning difficulties and developmental disorders and children's sleep. Welcome Amanda. You're, you're back Based at the Olga Tennyson Autism Research Centre, could you tell us a little bit about your centre and uh, its, its main goals? Um, the Autism Research Centre here at La Trobe University was um, founded by private donation from Mrs Olga Tennyson initially in 2008, which was matched by the university. And our goals are to provide uh, training and research uh, related to autism spectrum disorders uh, to to facilitate that in information going out into the community to practitioners. We have an early assessment clinic where we only uh, see children under the age of three years with Victorian site for the federally funded autism specific early learning and care centre where we're investigating the, um, early intervention programs using the early start Denver model and uh, we're also involved in the autism CRC and I myself I'm involved in the autism CRC um, in the adult area and uh, so we've, we've grown astronomically in the five years since I've been here and I have a particular interest and have had for over 20 years in the sleep problems that we see in children with autism. 
Well, it's great to have your input tonight, Amanda, and you can see from the number of registrants tonight that clearly, uh, clinically, there's a great need for education and information about autism and sleep disturbance. So uh, we also have, last but not least, uh, on the panel tonight, Sue McCabe. Sue has over 30 years of clinical experience as an occupational therapist working with people of all ages with neurodevelopmental disorders. Over the past 10 years, she's developed the Sleep Solutions Service at the Centre for Cerebral Palsy in Western Australia. Welcome, Sue. Uh, as, as, an, as an occupational therapist, how did you become interested in in sleep and, and choose to practice or focus your practice in sleep? Um, I think it's a similar story to Alex in that I was working with people of all ages with cerebral palsy and it became more and more apparent that their sleep difficulties and their daytime sleepiness was having a huge impact on their function and their well-being and also in fact that of their caregivers. That was particularly um, evident. Often caregivers is not coping with with day-to-day -day life because they was, had such little sleep. So that got me interested. Um, our services now, initially I was just looking at people with cerebral palsy, but our, our service is now funded by the state government. So we see people of all ages with, with all conditions. So probably about 50% of the people we see have autism spectrum disorder, mm -hmm. but we still see people with conditions such as acquired brain injury, cerebral palsy, other conditions like that as well. Great, great to have you, Sue. So uh, the uh, f a few ground rules about the webinar tonight before we commence. Uh, so we ask all participants to be respectful of other participants and panelists, uh, and we ask you all to behave as it's to, as though it is a face-to-face -face activity. Uh, post your comments and questions for panelists in the general chat box that you'll have in front of you, uh, and for help with technical issues, uh, post in the technical help uh, chat box. Your feedback is very important to us and we ask that you complete the short exit survey which will appear uh, as a pop-up uh, when you exit the webinar. Now the learning objectives for the uh, webinar are presented uh, on the slide that you have before you and I remind you that the materials uh, relating to the webinar can be found at, at the bottom right hand corner of your screen if you click on documents uh, you'll find the case study and supporting materials for the webinar tonight. So uh, the objectives are through this interdisciplinary panel discussion about the case study Georgie. The webinar will provide you with an opportunity to identify key principles of the featured disciplines approach in screening, diagnosing and treating children with autism spectrum disorder experiencing sleep disturbance, to recognize the mental health risks for both uh, the children with ASD and their families in the context of sleep disturbance. And I think that uh, the, 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 that particular uh, uh, objective is very clear in the case study when we look at the impact of the uh, sleep disturbance, both on the, uh, the child, Georgie, and her family. And also to explore tips and strategies for interdisciplinary collaboration uh, with relation to supporting families uh, of children with autism spectrum disorder experiencing sleep disturbance. So a few words about the case study. Uh, the e we're going to be talking about Georgie, uh, a young girl with autism spectrum disorder whose sleep disturbance is really impacting the whole family, uh, particularly her mother. Uh, the discussion will explore uh, how we can work together to better support children like Georgie and also importantly, her whole family. Now it's a complex case study that raises a number of issues. Uh, which clearly uh, lend themselves to multidisciplinary collaborative care models. And just out of interest to all of you, uh, the panel and I logged on, on just a few minutes ago. We immediately started talking about Georgie uh, as a case study and we got so engrossed in our discussion, we almost forgot to uh, you know, let the rest of you join as well. So it's going to be an exciting uh, discussion tonight and we're looking forward to it. So I'm going to um, ask each of the panel members to begin by presenting a perspective or a response to the case study really from their discipline's perspective. And so the format is going to be, we're going to have five minutes hearing from each of the panel members that really give us an overview of how uh, they would respond professionally and clinically uh, to uh, this case study. And then what we're going to do is take some time 
uh, to have a conversation among the clinicians here tonight and also take the opportunity to uh, answer some of the questions that are coming through from all of you uh, as participants tonight. So Alex, I'd like to start by handing over to you to hear uh, about your perspective on, on, on Georgie. Thank you, Shanta. Um, I guess my perspective as a GP is uh, looking at the family in a relatively holistic uh, manner and clearly the first person who presents here is mum who is uh, at the end of her tether. Um, as I've met, you can see on the slide, that I really perceive uh, the key figure in this case as being mother. Um, in lots of ways there is many supports for uh, Georgie herself and uh, I'm going to leave this, the more specialist side of things in terms of the autism and the ASDs, autistic spectrum disorders, to uh, those who are more specialised, but look more at the general case of how we can support uh, mother and uh, the rest of the family, as well as Georgie, in uh, getting through this, um, particularly this early stage and particularly with sleep. So my feeling really is that we need to see that uh, autistic spectrum disorders do affect, as do other um, uh, neurodevelopmental problems, they affect the whole family. Uh, clearly mother in this case is the key figure and, and support for her is um, uh, absolute paramount. And if mother doesn't function, then the family won't function and especially Georgie won't be able to undertake all the things that are necessary. And as you can see, mum is totally exhausted. There are many reasons for this. And I start with um, perhaps um, dad being away three quarters of the time. He's away much of the time, so the whole of the burden falls on mother. Now, when dad comes home, he could be helpful. Maybe he'd take the other two children out and, and let mum have a bit of uh, quiet time to herself, or he may just be in just another person that mother has to look after. So we're not quite sure how father fits, uh, fits into this pattern. Um, to other children, so often don't we see when there's one child with a disability in the family that they seem to get, understandably, uh, most of the attention and the other children tend to get left out. I'm sure mum tries very hard for this not to happen, but to some degree it's inevitable. Um, the key carer overnight is, uh, is, ma is the mother again. Whilst Geordie gets lots of support at school and uh, after, immediately after school, for that two-thirds of the time when Georgie's either at home or it's night time, uh, mother is clearly the, the key uh, carer and factor in Georgie's life and um, it, it's really leading to a great deal of uh, stress on mum's uh, part. So um, in, in addition, finally of course, uh, when Georgie's at school and the siblings at school, instead of taking time out, she's actually uh, going to work and I guess that that's uh, probably as much a financial imperative as it is that she wants to just do something outside the house. Um, so basically, the first thing is listen to what mother has to say. I think this is the most important thing. So often when people come in to talk to me about insomnia, and this is adults as well as children, that they're so relieved to be able to find someone who actually is prepared to listen, who has a little bit of understanding about sleep uh, and the uh, traumas that they're going through. So sympathetic ear is almost one of the more, most important things to, to be able to offer. Uh, there are many support groups in the area. If they know where to look, um, yeah, I know certainly I'm in New Zealand and there are certainly many uh, support uh, areas uh, for uh, ASD uh, groups in uh, both for the children but also for family members as well. If the GP feels comfortable uh, about offering some behavioural strategies to try and help the child, which I'm sure we'll be hearing about uh, in the next few uh, uh, presentations, then uh, by all means do so. But be, make sure that you're confident about uh, what you're telling the child because so often misinformation gets uh, promulgated by people who are not quite sure or maybe they've had advice from their own mother or parents um, and it may not be uh, totally accurate advice. So if you're confident to do so, by all means I'll offer advice. But primarily, obviously, as far as um, Georgie is concerned, um, referring to a paediatrician, particularly one with a special interest in ASDs and sleep, uh, would be uh, ideal. But in of course in Georgie's case, she seems to be getting lots of uh, support anyway. One of the key factors I go on about uh, in terms of seeing uh, 
talking to GPs is that uh, this question about just asking about sleep, asking about snoring. So often I hear, oh, well, uh, Johnny snores, but so does dad, so that's OK, isn't it? Um, no, it's not. If children are snoring, uh, it needs to be dealt with. And I know that's one of Georgie's problems that will be discussed. Restless legs. People tend to think it's just uh, uh, older women who get restless leg syndrome if you ask around. It happens in children. Up to 2% of children have restless leg syndrome. Um, so, and often misdiagnosed or diagnosed as growing pains. Uh, offering, finding some respite care for mother. Really important to try and give them some uh, break in this uh, never-ending cycle of care. And finally, um, just exclude depression. We know that mothers who um, are significantly sleep deprived uh, with babies or with children, and of course in Georgia's case, uh, are very much more likely to be susceptible to uh, de depressive disorders. And uh, whilst I wouldn't immediately want to keep on handing out medication here, uh, that support again is going to be vitally important for her. So uh, basically, um, all the support that Georgie may be getting we need, there needs to be communicated back to mum. And this is where these other specialists that we'll be talking with um, will always, I would hope, uh, refer back to the GP, uh, but also to uh, particularly to mother so that she understands the strategies that are be, uh, supposed to be helpful. Uh, and um, particularly things like resolution of this constipation, uh, help with advice with the snoring and what should be done there. So basically, uh, I'm just keen on supporting uh, mother and uh, asking, making sure that we ask about sleep uh, and not to shy away from sleep, uh, which I might come back to later in the presentation, uh, and particularly, of course, ask about snoring. Thanks, uh, Shanta. Thanks so much, uh, Alex. Clearly, there's a critical role for the uh, GP in, in, in the management uh, of, of Georgie's uh, sleep complaints. And uh, you mentioned that in a complex case, uh, you know, you would refer on to a paediatric sleep physician. And so we're delighted to have uh, Margot Davey uh, on, on the panel as well. So Margot, I think perhaps at this time I'll hand over to you to give us your response as a paediatric sleep physician uh, on the management of, of, of Georgie's uh, sleep complaints and also the complex uh, issues that are presented to the family as well. Thank you, Shanta. Um, I certainly agree with everything Alex has said and I, I think um, in terms of a clinical approach on this slide I've talked about the things I go through but time and time again I find people are very um, threatened by sleep problems and don't quite know how to tackle them. And so one of the things I'd prefer to focus on is just giving you a framework for actually taking a history because um, I feel that um, if you don't understand how to take a history then it's very hard to help. And this mnemonic, uh, which is called the BEARS mnemonic, um, just helps you go through uh, a sleep history during the day and the night, finding out exactly the times, the routines, what's happened, what are the main issues in terms of falling asleep, waking up during the night, um, and helping to get an idea of the regularity of patterns, different caregivers, different um, times, whether it's a school, day or whether it's a weekend or whether it's a holiday and then S for the snoring. And I think the other thing about sleep history is it's over 24 hours. Uh, it's really important to make sure, particularly with children who have increasing developmental disabilities, it's very easy for them to sometimes be on long journeys to and from school and that can be an extra hour in the morning, an extra hour in the afternoon coming home from school falling asleep. So finding out exactly how much sleep is happening and uh, what time. George is a bit like a Pandora's box uh, in terms of problems that could be happening and really with my medical hat on just reading through this and getting the history from the parents and the mum, um, certainly there are lots of things that could be contributing to uh, frequent wakings during the night and difficulty settling during the night. Uh, any child with epilepsy, you want to make sure that it's well controlled uh, and that unrecognised seizures aren't happening. Similarly, a medication sometimes can cause significant insomnia and the lamotrigine is certainly a medication that can really disrupt sleep onset. Similarly, um, 
the enuresis uh, and uh, having a, a, a bed that's wet each night disturbs sleep. And similarly, Mum alluded to the constipation and she seems to have more pain. So exploring that further. Um, it's not normal for children to snore and trying to tease out children who have significant snoring, uh, which is representative of, of obstructive sleep apnea, um, finding out whether or not a child breathes with their mouth open or shut, whether or not parents actually witness apneic episodes or choking or gasping. And unfortunately, some of this is in the eye of the beholder. What one parent calls um, snoring, another parent says, oh, noisy breathing, or they actually don't notice as significant. So finding out and exploring that a bit more is important. Alex has alluded to the restless legs, but one of the things I also uh, make sure is finding out their dietary history. Uh, often children with autism are very fixed with what they're going to eat in terms of colour or texture and oftentimes they have very limited diet and certainly uh, low iron stores uh, is uh, related to restless legs or periodic limb movements overnight and also can be related to poor sleep. Um, I mentioned autism here. I think there are some definite neurobiological uh, differences in this group. It's not the same for everyone. But I think that is another medical problem contributing to these sleep patterns. And then anxiety. Uh, certainly uh, with older children, um, you can see more pervasive anxiety contributing. Um, the other thing then is exploring the sleep. And I talked about how to take this history, finding out uh, what's happened in the past and how mum has uh, approached this, and really reiterating a lot of the things that Alex has said. And not that there's anything magic that we do sometimes, it's more individualising the approach so that this family are happy with it, have enough support around that they can be consistent with it to then introduce changes that are able to be sustained. Um, and I think the other thing is also making sure that the family are united in what they want. Uh, before I set in place any treatment plan, it's no point having one parent want one thing and another parent want another because uh, I, I think that's doomed for failure. And then the other thing is finding out if the parents do want a child to sleep with them or not sleep with them. We call this reactive co-sleeping when parents end up doing it out of desperation rather than because they want to. Mm. So I, I think the treatment strategies really I would divide into addressing all the medical problems um, I think just a couple of things I'd like to point out. A lot of times children with significant developmental disabilities, families feel that it's just part and parcel of the disability, the sleep problems, and there's nothing they can do. And a lot of the behavioural strategies that work with children without disabilities certainly work in this group and it's really important to address that. Anxiety is sometimes quite tricky to tease out. Um, and then the other thing is medication. Uh, sometimes people feel medications won't work or they've got too many side effects or they're going to be on it for life so therefore they don't want to start. So there are two things I'd just like to highlight. Great. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Margot. So uh, a couple of questions coming through uh, from the uh, registrants that I just wanted to uh, point out. Firstly, all of the uh, documents, the materials for the uh, webinar tonight, including the slides, are available in the Documents tab on the right-hand corner uh, of your screen. If you click that, you'll see uh, the uh, materials including the case study uh, and don't worry about trying to write down I think a number of you uh, would have been very interested in that uh, framework that Margot presented uh, for taking the case history of course all of that is available on the slide pack that's uh, that's available Amanda I'd like to hand over to you next uh, to, to get a perspective from you uh, as a psychologist I think I'm going to end up um, reiterating much of what Alex and Margot have also said Shanta but um, I started off with my slides in, in just when I read through what was my what were my first sets of responses and and like Alex it was really this is a complex case mm -hmm. and with Georgie having multiple problems that are likely to be um, somewhat interrelated so difficult behaviors related to sleep problems for example um, daytime napping at school or sleepiness at school related to the nighttime sleep but most particularly the fact that mother's tired, her husband isn't there to support her most of the time and she's got these other children to support in the family conflict that may be arising as a result of that. 
and certainly our, our research and uh, and the clinical experience that the others point out is that mothers of children with developmental disorders or typically developing children with significant sleep problems are at high risk for sleep problems themselves and anxiety and depression. So that's a real consideration for mum and helping mum. Um, so in terms of the background, when I was going through the background as a psychologist, these were a couple of some things that um, crossed my mind that I'd like to know about, particularly how Georgie communicates and her level of functioning because they're going to be important things for how we decide to um, implement a, any sort of behaviour intervention. If we if we do do so, we, we really need to know a little bit more about Georgie from that perspective. Um, I thought it was interesting that she gets ear infections, that because they can contribute to to um, sleep problems. And um, I thought it'd be important to also know a bit more about her support team. She does seem to have good support, but her support team may actually be able to be used in some way to help with um, supporting mother and. Um, helping with aspects of the sleep intervention because one of the things we'd like to probably stop is uh, napping on the way home and, uh, and this uh, nap potential for napping and so on at school because that's going to interfere with nighttime sleep. <coughs> Excuse me. In, in terms of um, then Georgie's sleep, um, I'd want to get a history of the sleeping problems and the bears that um, Margot outlined is really excellent for that. and. Um, Georgie's been to sleep school, so I'd be interested to know what advice she got there and why Mum got there and why it didn't work or why it might have worked um, and isn't working now because that might have some bearing on what we want to do um, in the future. And then these were the things I thought that we knew that may in some way relate to her sleep problem and, and you'll see there's a range of things that we already know and a number of them um, are potentially might have some sort of medical background to them whereas others uh, maybe behavioural and re related to the sleep problem. In terms of um, the psychologist's perspective, because there um, are multiple problems there, one can really say, well, where do I start? Do I start with the family? Do I start with the child's behaviour and sleep? Do I start with the medical issues? So the first thing that one really would want to do, I think, is to take a full history about Georgie and, and the presenting issues. So we'd want some background as well as what's going on with the current sleep problem. And I always think a sleep diary is useful to get a handle on the current sleep problem. Getting parents to keep, keep a sleep diary for one to two weeks if, if possible. Um, noting, uh, noting things that might go wrong that might have affected the sleep on particular days. And I think it's important that we actually deal with those medical issues first. And I think it's important that psychologists and other um, non-medical professionals recognise that medical problems um, can contribute significantly to children's sleep issues and that they probably should be checked out and be being dealt with before one gets into behavioural interventions if the medical problems appear to be here. And as others have highlighted, there's the constipation and the bedwetting, the snoring. She's sweating at night. Um, I'm not sure whether that may also uh, have have some sort of medical background and she's waking screaming, she's got epilepsy. So is, as Margot said, the epilepsy well controlled. So those are things the psychologist needs to refer for and mm. to get checked out. So what can the psychologist do? I think the families need to be, need to be prioritised. You need to start where the family, family wants to start. Um, and two, Fairly simple and important things that one can do with the family is help them to develop some good daytime and bedtime routines uh, for Georgie that are consistent because that's going to really help with, the, help with the sleep and help with any sleep intervention that's going to be put in place. Look at Georgie's bedtime environment. For example, um, iPads and so on are very, uh, mm. very um, flavour of the month with children with autism. and Research is coming out now, including some work that we've done, that children with autism in particular who use screens in the bedroom um, actually have poorer sleep. They sleep less than other children do. There's the enuresis, so helping with toilet training may, may be um, useful. 
before we even get to the actual sleep issues themselves. And dealing with some of those things may already start to deal with the sleep issues. And then we need to determine a behavioural strategy and there are a number to choose from and that really should be done in relation to the case and also what the family feels they, they can actually handle to, to facilitate the bedtime routine, to deal with the night waking and the co-sleeping if they want to and to eliminate daytime naps and sleeping, significant sleeping in. Mm. And assisting parents to deal with daytime behaviour and most importantly finding some way of um, supporting mum because mum is key to this and she's at the end, end of the road. Thanks, uh, thanks, Amanda. We're going to come back, I think, uh, to explore the behavioural strategies more. I think a number of the uh, uh, the uh, registrants tonight are very interested in, in non-pharmacological uh, treatment approaches. So I think we might come back in our conversation to that. But but let's move on uh, to hear from uh, from Sue to get an occupational therapist perspective. Thank you, Sue. Hi, thanks, Shanta. Um, I guess it's it's a good sign, really, isn't it, that that everything that the speakers before me have said, I feel like I'm repeating, so I guess in a way it's a good thing because we're on the same page really. Um, from an OT perspective, we would try to do our assessment in a family home if possible. Probably the only reason we wouldn't is if the family chose to not have us in their home. And also, it, I imagine it would be far more successful and effective if we could have both parents at that meeting. Um, the way I work is that I always, we usually get referrals from the child therapy or intervention support team. So I think if I was doing an assessment, I would love to have a key person from that team participating. So someone who already knows Georgie, knows her family, and already knows what kinds of supports and interventions are in place. So in, from an OT perspective, they're the people who will be following up and doing a lot of the follow up and carry over. Um, I'd also be asking the team for some background information about their family strengths and challenges, their culture, health, what existing supports are in place, um, just the nature of the household and also housing. Some of the people we see sometimes housing itself is a challenge and that can have an impact on, on their resources in terms of just you know, how many bedrooms are there, what kind of space do they have, who are they sharing the space with. Um, so definitely just that context for the assessment. I'd go even further than that with assessment. So we, I would do probably spend maybe an hour to an hour and a half with a semi-structured interview to try and get a whole picture about what's happening with Georgie, some background about her general sleep, um, and then focusing on issues that are more common to children with, with conditions like autism. So asking about, as others have mentioned, asking about you know, restless legs, um, what's happening with her snoring and her breathing, daytime sleepiness. To get that picture, that would then guide me as an OT in terms of where I need to refer to in, in terms of GPs, paediatricians, ask whether or not we should be asking for ENT referrals, etc. Um, we definitely provide opportunity for parents to talk about what their concerns are, what their goals are, what they expect, what they believe is, is good sleep in their family. And I find we often have to ask the same question a few ways. You can't just ask one question and get a straight answer. Um, often parents need to hear the same question a few ways so we really get the picture clearly. Um, further to the assessment, I find, as Amanda mentioned, sleep diaries can be a fantastic tool. I find activity logs are also really useful. I know um, all the other three presenters have talked about the fact that daytime activity, what, what Georgie does and when she does it, could be having a big impact on her sleep. So we'll be, we write to an activity log where we can get the family to write down different things she does during the day. Does she do swimming on a certain day? Does she have time spent out in the park or playground? And what's her sleep like in relation to daytime activities? We might offer um, the use of an overnight video if we wanted to get more information about her, her evening and settling behaviours, about the sleep environment, and also to get a picture of what's actually happening during the night in the home setting. Sometimes the video can show us things that perhaps even the parents haven't seen or noticed and that's quite a useful tool. Um, then in terms of intervention for Georgie, I guess we'd be talking, as the others have mentioned, about general health. Even though medication etc is not something that I'd be prescribing, I'd certainly be asking about what her 
timing and dosages of med medication, um, how that seems to be having an impact on her daytime sleepiness. And certainly if she, in Georgie's case, she is seeing her, her GP, but if she wasn't seeing a GP or her pediatrician, I'd be certainly saying, look, you need to let your doctor know about this, talk to your doctor. Equally, we'll be asking about anything that might suggest restless leg syndrome, periodic leg movement disorder, other parasomnias such as night terrors, etc., to rule those out, and particularly sleep disordered breathing. We just ask questions around that that could guide us in terms of referring back to the medical specialist. Um, we talk a lot about her daily and evening routines, what she likes to do, when she likes to do them, what happens at school. In particular, I think it was um, Margot who mentioned weekends. What happens on the weekends? Does she sleep in longer? How does that affect her rhythms and her routines? We'd also look at the household, bedroom environment, daytime activities. Morning sunlight I find is a really interesting one. Often when we go into people's homes, we notice that people tend to keep their house very dark just I guess it's to keep the heat out. And I'm often surprised at how little sunlight the children might be getting. And we know that that can have an impact on melatonin and, um, they, and propensity to sleep in the evening. So we'd look at all those things. And in particular, I'd be asking about what are her teen already doing um, in the school setting around things like her behaviour, her communication, sensory regulation. What kind of support is already in place for her participation in her everyday activity? What do we already know makes her calm, what revs her up, and how can we build that into her evening routines and strategies? Um, in terms of intervention, I would certainly try and take the opportunity to, to talk to Georgie's mum and dad about what happens with typical sleep. So make sure that they're aware of aspects of circadian rhythms, the need for routines, and um, the timing and the routine of activities, etc. Um, and we'd also start talking about ways and how important it is to teach Georgie to actually fall asleep in her own bed. So that whole importance of that sleep onset association. So we'd take a lot of time looking at ways to help that happening in a way that works for the family. Um, and again, bring in the team as much as possible. There's possibly already strategies in place around her behaviour, communication, social stories, things like that. So we um, look at that and see if the team can offer social work or psychosocial support for a mum who sounds like she's getting quite burnt out. Yes. Um, finally, some specific strategies from an OT point of view. Lots of things around helping to manage the environment or set it up so that it's as safe and comfortable um, as it needs to be for Georgie. So talk about things like What's happening in the evening? Is the TV on? Is it loud? What kind of alternatives might there be to help create a calming and settling environment? We look at the bedroom environment. What's happening with light and dark? Do we need dimming night lights? Are there fans or heaters that can make a difference? We'd focus on specifically on bed comfort as well. If Georgie's got um, issues with her continence and enuresis, what kind of moisture-proof bedding are the family already using? If they're using you know, a plastic sheet from Bunnings, what kind of impact is that having on her comfort and her, her thermoregulation? We might be able to lend her special um, airflow um, mm. underlays or thermoregulation bedding. And finally, from an OT perspective, we'd look at um, sensory tools that could make a difference with her self-regulation in terms of being able to become more calm and more settled both before sleep and during sleep. And there's lots of, lots of different sensory um, strategies that might be really relevant for Georgie. Thanks, uh, thanks, Sue. That's uh, that's terrific to get that perspective. And I think uh, a number of questions have come up about the uh, environment as well. Look, mm -hmm. I um, would now like to uh, really invite the panel uh, uh, that's with us tonight to, to, to begin a conversation um, that, that really draws upon some of the themes that comes from, from, from their presentations. And also this is an opportunity for all of you who are listening as well to join in the conversation as well. We can't see you, but we can read your comments and we welcome uh, you to make comments in the general uh, chat box. But I thought I'd start, there's a co few comments that have already come through on, uh, on, on melatonin. And so I thought I might start by asking Alex. Alex, I understand you had a question that you wanted to pose to Margot. 
uh, and it was on the use of melatonin uh, in, in, a, in, in, in this sort of a case. Would you like to go ahead and ask Margot that, uh, that, that Yes, uh, well, melatonin has become a very popular treatment, of course, for uh, children with ASD and ADHD. Um, and I'm aware that melatonin really works in two ways, either as a, a sedative, soporific, um, but also as a chronobiotic in altering sleep cycles. And I'm just wondering whether there's any evidence that uh, there is actually melatonin deficiency in either ASD or ADHD. I'm aware that there might be in either of those, but how robust is the evidence that there's actually, or, or is it mainly just as a sedative that this uh, that the melatonin works in this case? Um, look, there are certainly several small studies around uh, that are looking at the evidence for melatonin. Um, some have shown that there's an abnormal platelet serotonin. Serotonin's the uh, sort of precursor of melatonin, and certainly that's a sort of biochemical finding in children. Um, we've also there've been a couple. Well, the papers have looked at melatonin receptors and uh, there have been sort of genetic abnormalities uh, shown with those. And there's also been um, uh, a couple of papers looking at uh, one of the enzymes that is responsible for the synthesis of melatonin from serotonin and showing mutations in that particular enzyme as well. So I think there is a suggestion that there is an abnormality. Um, I suppose the concern that I have is that Melatonin isn't necessarily the answer. And also if you have significant sleep associations, uh, children can sort of override the effect of melatonin. They may be uh, sedated at the beginning of the night and go to sleep, but you're still going to have frequent nighttime wakings if children, uh, if you're not using the medication in conjunction with addressing some of the issues that will relate to nighttime waking. Thank you. Thanks, Margot. So you, you uh, mentioned, the, or Alex, uh, I think in his question, was talking about these different actions of melatonin. Chronobiotic refers to this action of melatonin on the biological clock, and that suggests that there is some biological clock or circadian rhythm disturbance uh, that, that, that melatonin could potentially correct or treat. Margot, do you see uh, circadian rhythm disturbances uh, often in, in, in autism, uh, children with autism spectrum disorders. There is a suggestion, I guess, in the case study that uh, Georgie uh, has this tendency to sleep late. Would that, in your mind as a clinician, suggest to you that there could be a circadian rhythm disturbance? Um, I think probably in this case, having read it, I think by the time you went into the nitty gritty, Georgie isn't falling asleep till very late. Mm. And then if she has her normal sleep requirement, that's why she sleeps in and then she's cut short on school days because she has to get up and go to school and then she catches up and then you have a nap in the, week, uh, in the evening that's been contributing to difficulties with sleep onset. The children that I see with autism who I think there are problems, and this is, I see it a lot, and even children before they're given a diagnosis is dividing the night up into two and having this prolonged waking for anywhere between two to four hours. They don't want any interaction, they don't want to see a parent, they just wake, they entertain themselves and it can go on for hours. And so I see that too often to not feel that there is something in terms of the way the neuroanatomy, neurobiology, neurochemicals are working in this group. Um, and, and just quickly, Margot, uh, there's a question also uh, that uh, one of the participants has asked. Is there an age limit? Uh, you know, for, for prescribing melatonin, what what age would you would you give melatonin? Uh, look, I must say, I see people prescribing it for babies. I personally do not. Um, I would be addressing a lot of the behavioural and schedule uh, strategies first, uh, but then certainly in sort of three and four year olds. If you were doing all that and you have a family coming to you with very good patterns and routines and there's not a lot else you can work on, then I'm certainly happy prescribing melatonin. The other thing I think we do really badly is we give very high doses and I think that there's not a lot of evidence for that. Uh, people try a little bit and then they build it up and up and up and then I think there's actually a lot of work out there that you tend to dull the receptors to it and so you actually have to stop it. So I, I think uh, using small doses and addressing other issues is uh, the way I would go. And Santa, I had a couple of comments that sure. I could 
tap that from a from a research perspective. Um, certainly, with the the other thing that people have suggested may be um, abnormal in a subgroup of children with autism that there's a, a very small amount of evidence for is the clock genes that control circadian rhythms and there and including melatonin rhythm. So I suggest an off the space delayed rhythm or a, or a dampened rhythm. But um, and some people have a couple of papers have shown reduced melatonin. But as we were discussing earlier, um, this paper just been published from Beth Mallow's group in the United States with nine three to eight year olds and they've shown who have responded to low dose melatonin um, for settling and, and um, getting to sleep more quickly. And they found no no abnormality in the melatonin rhythm in those nine children. Mm. So I think there's likely to be variation. And as Margot says, um, perhaps for some children there is a problem, but for others there probably isn't. Could I just uh, add a little bit to that, sure. saying sure. that well, my real feeling about melatonin is that possibly the more important uh, aspect of uh, the circadian rhythm is going to be is getting out into the light during the morning. I mean, I think mm. morning light is probably more powerful than any melatonin that can be used. I don't know how you yeah. feel about that, Shantha, but I think that uh, getting the children outside, particularly in that morning light, is much, much better at uh, regulating their circadian cycle. So morning uh, light and, and, and light and the light-dark cycle, of course, is, is, is the, the, the primary cue for circadian rhythms. And if you suspect a circadian rhythm disturbance, and, and Amanda has just talked about uh, some work that points to uh, you know, a, an underlying mechanism uh, that could explain this circadian rhythm disturbance that's at least observed in you know, a subset of children with autism spectrum disorders. So Alex, absolutely right that, that light therapy and just strengthening the light-dark cycle could be uh, a very important and effective treatment approach. Now, morning light has the effect of uh, advancing or bringing earlier in time uh, circadian rhythms and evening or late night exposure has the opposite effect and uh, uh, Amanda mentioned in her presentation uh, this increasing trend for uh, on you know use of uh, devices electronic devices and so on that emit light and so that's another thing to look for is that the use of those devices late in the night can exacerbate this delayed sleep problem because light exposure at that time can actually delay a circadian rhythm so so Alex that's a, a really valuable comment in terms of a of another treatment approach sure, can I add to that <clears throat> from a, um, a therapist perspective I think that's a great point where, I, where it's a really good way to, to use the child's therapy team to see if there's a way that, of building that into uh, the support that they can provide. So on a number of occasions we've had the child therapists who are already going into the school, working with the teachers, they're able to talk to the teachers about can the school provide opportunities for morning outdoor activities. Mm -hmm. We, we stress it with the families and we talk about you know, is there a chance that the child could eat their breakfast out on the back veranda or whatever. But often families feel that they're very rushed. If the child is difficult to wake in the morning, it's hard to get that opportunity. They can't get the child to walk to school. So it's a really nice way of linking in with the school, get the team to, to explain to the school how important it is to have that morning light. And often they're, they're more than willing to build in it that outdoor activity at the start of the day, which is a really nice way of doing it, I think. Thanks, Sue. So, Sue, maybe I'll, I'll, I wanted to put another question to you that's uh, uh, that's coming from uh, some of the uh, uh, registrants as well. You mentioned a number of different ways of investigating a Georgie's sleep disturbance, sleep diary, actigraphy, and Amanda and the others also talked about these. One of the questions is when you have, uh, in, in this case, Georgie's mother, who's, as you pointed out, you know, really burnt out, how successful are you in getting the family to engage in completing things like a sleep diary uh, and, and getting, I mean, an actigraphy, there was actually a question from one of the registrants just to clarify, actigraphy mm -hmm. is a wrist-borne device that has yeah. an accelerometer in it that measures activity levels and allows a clinician to be able to in, you know, uh, measure the rest activity cycle, have an objective measure of the rest activity cycle. So, mm -hmm. so how do you get someone like Georgie's mum to engage uh, and, and really uh, participate in this kind of uh, documentation process? Yeah. That's a fantastic question and, and, it, and it's exactly right. When families have already got a 
huge burden of care. Often sleep diaries and logs are the hardest thing to ask people to do. And that's in fact where we find actigraphy to be very useful because often depending on the child's behaviours, there's some children who don't tolerate wearing a little device around their wrist, but we find that most children do. It's just like a little plastic wristband really. And sometimes we say to parents, look, this is a really good way for us to get a good clear picture of what the patterns are at the moment in terms of her time she does go to sleep and what time she wakes up. It's a really good way of seeing what happens on weekends and weekend naps and sleeping in. And you get a lovely visual um, overview of those sleep and wake patterns with perhaps minimal burden on the family. Um, I find some families really want to write everything down. It's kind of such a big deal. They, they want to tell you everything. Others, it's like they'll start and by the second day they've dribbled out and it's just too hard. So in terms of diaries and activity logs, it, it varies from one family to the other. So um, another question that's coming up from the uh, audience is about diet. And I understand you wanted to ask Amanda a question uh, yeah. about the role of diet and dietary factors. Do you, do you want to go ahead and ask Amanda that question? Yeah, sure. Um, Mandy, we've talked about this in the past, I know. Um, you mentioned to me a couple of years ago about a study that you've been involved in looking at groups of children who, one group who had a, um, a diet that was free of preservatives and additives. And I know that this whole conversation about what children eat and its impact on their behaviour has come and gone as being a difficult conversation over the years. But I, I find what you told me to be really interesting, particularly because I find a lot of children with ASD and in particular ADHD um, seem to have a, an obsession with really strong flavoured foods such as you know, mee goreng noodles and things that are high in those artificial flavours. And I'm just wondering you know, what your comment is based on your previous studies that you've done. Um, yeah, that's a great question, Sue. Um, diet's a big issue in children with autism spectrum disorder and I really don't think there's any good evidence for a gluten and casein problem in these children, so I want to dispense with that one. But what Sue's referring to actually is a PhD project, which sadly this PhD student has presented at conferences but never quite got to the publication stage. But she compared a behavioural intervention versus the, what's essentially the fail safe diet, which is used um, at the Royal Prince Alfred Hospital um, Allergy Clinic and I think also similar to the one that Sue Dengate uses. And she compared that for children with severe behaviour problems. So they didn't necessarily have a clinical diagnosis of anything else and they were screened into it and we did have a paediatrician as her second supervisor. So we tried to be very controlled with this. And some of the, five of the children happened to have Asper a diagnosis of Asperger's syndrome. Basically what we found was these children uh, responded very well to a diet that, that was, um, and it surprised us how many of them did because it was virtually all of them, responded very well to the diet that was free of um, preservatives and additives and salicylates and amines. Now that doesn't mean that the children would necessarily have responded negatively to all of those compounds, but rather that the, they were probably responding to some of them and the research needs um, certainly needs to be repeated. So their behaviour improved but we also had some sleep questionnaires in there and we found that their sleep improved along with their behaviour on these diets. So I think it's an interesting question for a subgroup of children. It's not autism specific and it requires um, some, some added, um, certainly requires more research. But if you were suspicious that this was going on, you should really go to a dietitian and test this out properly. Parents shouldn't be rushing off and non-qualified people shouldn't be rushing off and altering children's diets. Great. Uh, thank you, Amanda. That uh, addresses another comment that one of the participants made tonight is the role of the dietitian. And um, soon I'm going to be coming back to each of the, um, the panel members to ask them a little bit about how they uh, interact with other clinicians in, in, in cases such as Georgie's because, you know, we want to understand how to, uh, how to collaborate in, in, in the care of, of a complex case like this. So we'll, we'll hear again from the panel members on that issue. Uh, I, Margot, I understand you had a question for Alex um, on how a GP, Alex, uh, had some wonderful perspectives about, you know, really listening to 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 Georgie's mum, 
Uh, you had a question about the issues, the practical issues facing GPs. Do you want to go ahead and ask uh, Alex that question? Um, well, I suppose looking at my first slide that I did and not being able to go through it, and I have a lot more time with patients than a GP does, and I found, as Alex said, a sympathetic ear, but trying to obtain a history is a very time-consuming exercise, and I'm sure that's why there's a lot more prescriptions out there. Um, because it's much easier to write a script than take an extensive history. In your practice, um, do you, how do you sort of categorise what you take in the time that you have? And do you have any sh shortcuts or flags that you could share with us? Yeah, I think that's a really important question because um, you know, now I'm running more sleep clinics. I'm, I'm, I actually have an hour with a patient, which is an absolute luxury for anybody who's been involved in general practice. Um, one of the strategies I suggest that to start with, don't fear asking about sleep. Uh, one of the worries is you ask about sleep and suddenly you open uh, you know, a Pandora's box of all the problems that have come out and the people are a bit fearful of that. Um, so what I often do is ask, uh, suggest, ask about sleep. If they do come up with some sort of sleep problem that they're worried about or just sleep in general, uh, then I'd suggest that you make a, a, a separate consultation for that. So, um, and in the interim, there are one or two uh, sleep questionnaires which would be very uh, interesting. There are ones for adults and there are also sleep questionnaires that are useful for children as well. Uh, and so these can be accessed, I'm sure, uh, through your, um, uh, your GP, they would be able to find those. And indeed, most of them are on the internet anyway. Um, so for the GP to give, uh, or the primary health carer, really. I mean, whether it's a pharmacist or a, a psychologist who's seeing the patient for the first time and they're coming up with this sleep and you don't know how you're going to deal with it in the time you've got, um, make a special appointment to see them, get them to do a sleep diary, get them to do a sleep questionnaire specifically, and then they can come back with this information and, and you've sort of already started the, the conversation going at that stage. Uh, because, as you say, you can't take a, a full sleep history in, in 10 minutes. Or, and often people come up at the last minute and say, oh, by the way, my child's not sleeping very well right. at the end of the consultation, uh, which you, know, uh, you, you haven't got time to go into that. Yes. So setting up a special time, I think, is probably the key and using some of those uh, sleep questionnaires. Great. Thank you, uh, Alex. So uh, there's a few questions coming up, uh, Sue, that I might uh, direct to you. Uh, Sue, uh, and, and in fact, Margot also was interested in, in, in getting this perspective from you. Can you tell us a little bit about your experience with weighted blankets? Are they effective uh, and which patients would you uh, choose to use them with? Sure. Um, yes, I've certainly found them to be effective with many of the children that we've worked with. It's, I find it very hard to, but certainly not all. I think any therapist who are working with children from a sensory regulation point of view will, will, t will say that it's a very individual thing. And so first of all, we'd, do a, we'd ask the questions about, well, what, what kind of sensory experiences does the child seem to find more calming and soothing? How does the child respond to the deep pressure that weighted blankets provide? Often we find that the children get as much benefit from weighted blankets before sleep time as they do during sleep time. So often children might actually have a weighted toy or a weighted blanket over their shoulders or on their lap while they're eating their dinner or while they're doing a calming activity, having a story read. That deep pressure seems to help bring them down, make them calmer, more, felt, more regulated. Um, and then in terms of how they use during sleep, very individualised. We always recommend that the parents observe and monitor in the first instance, get a feel for how it's working for the child. In Australia, we find children often get very hot using the weighted blankets, so we've had some lovely success by using the blankets in conjunction with thermoregulation bedding. But I'd have to say every child's different and you have to really take each child you know, as an individual and, and, and let them trial it in little bits at first. Okay, thanks, thanks, Sue. Well, uh, we have lots of questions coming in, and we have uh, you know lots of questions. I know you'd like to ask each other as well, Margot. A quick, uh, quick question for you. There's a couple of uh, uh, audience members have asked the question about Ritalin and the use for uh, you know, potential for use of Ritalin in a case like this. Do you want to just comment on that? Um, I personally wouldn't be using Ritalin in a case like this. 
When children get insufficient sleep, often uh, you know their behaviour, um, their difficult behaviours, and uh, are exacerbated the next day. And I suppose you can go down that pathway of poor concentration, inattentiveness, and hyperactivity. But my concern is that due to sleep deprivation. And so rather than thinking about Ritalin, I would be really working hard on consolidating and maximising this child's sleep. Yes, okay. Uh, Margot, you had a question. There was a few comments from the audience as well about, um, about communication issues. You had a question for uh, Amanda about, uh, about uh, communication in a case like this. Do you want to just ask Amanda that question? Yeah, I think um, certainly in the higher functioning children with um, autism, anxiety is well recognised as being a, a comorbid a condition. And I, I think sometimes it's very hard to tease uh, that out, particularly if children aren't that verbal. And I suppose I wanted to ask you if you had a particular way that you approached that clinically, any particular questions or behaviours that you noted that might flag that anxiety is um, a significant component of this sleep problem? Yes, um, in terms of uh, anxiety in, in children with uh, autism, you're right, it's, it's a, a very big issue and in the high functioning children there's a lot of evidence that their settling problems in particular are likely to be related to anxiety for many of them. In low functioning Children, it's a question where, in particular younger ones, it's a question that we ask ourselves here at the Olga Tennis and Autism Research Centre. It isn't, it isn't easily done. But some of the things I'd look for would be separation anxiety, for example. So how does the child behave when mum leaves the room? I've seen some young children with autism become very distressed when, when, when mum leaves the room, for example, very highly distressed. Um, I'd look also at extreme avoidance behaviours. So are they um, very avoidant of things that uh, in, in the environment, particular things in the environment? I'd also look for increases in, in repetitive behaviours because there's certainly evidence that repetitive behaviours are related to an increased risk for sleep problems in these children. So um, under certain circumstances, is there an increase in these stereotypes and repetitive behaviours? And the other one is um, response to changes in the environment. Many children with autism don't like change in the environment and some children with autism are extremely sensitive to changes in the environment and this, this may also be an indicator of anxiety. And given the high level of anxiety in the higher functioning children who can tell us about it and it does seem to be a characteristic of the disorder, I think we'd be reasonable in suspecting that it's also a problem for lower functioning, many lower functioning children. Thanks, Amanda. Well, uh, I'm, I'm sorry to say, uh, everyone, we have so many questions still to address in a case like this, but uh, unfortunately, we're rapidly running out of time. And I want to hand back to each of the panelists to really come back to the heart of the mental health professionals network. And that is, how do we get uh, clinicians working more closely together uh, to address uh, complex cases like this? So I'd like uh, to just uh, let each of the panel members now just give one or two uh, concluding uh, sentiments, particularly focused around uh, the problems that they foresee and the opportunities they see in collaboration uh, in a case study like uh, Georgie. So I might start with you, uh, Alex, for your perspective. Um, I think so many uh, GPs obviously deal with this and, and primary health people generally deal with so many disorders uh, generally for adults and children that they're certainly not deemed to be uh, experts in these particular fields. So knowing and referring to people who you know have a special uh, interest and expertise in these particular disorders, almost whatever it is, uh, I think that's most important. Uh, the reverse, of course, as I mentioned in my initial uh, presentation, is that it's really important for those people to refer back to the, per, the primary health carer, uh, obviously in my case, uh, to the GP. Mm. Um, I think the final word to say from my perspective is that um, you know, children's sleep issues are, are common, um, even in the general public, um, in the general population. What you see with these neurodevelopmental disorders is that the sleep disorders are just that little, uh, a little bit more severe, a little bit more prevalent. Um, but the behavioural strategies that are used, the routines, the the, uh, the strategies that are used for children in general. 
uh, are very effective in all the children that we see. So just right. because you've got a very special child with a special um, particular uh, cl cluster of disorders, uh, it doesn't mean to say that these ordinary behavioural strategies that work for your, ordinary, for your children that you've had otherwise aren't going to work. They very frequently will, and there's lots of evidence to say that it's much more effective to do those than start prescribing medication and uh, even melatonin. Thanks, Alex. Uh, uh, Margot, could I hand over to you? And Margot, one of the uh, things that we haven't touched on is you know, where to access specialist care, particularly in the public system. So if you could just include that in your reflection as well as the, you know, in terms of uh, public services that might be available uh, in, in complex cases like this. Uh, thanks, Margot. Um, I think when you're assessing a case like this, part of the role, I suppose, of being a medical doctor is sometimes um, uh, uh, reassuring parents that there isn't anything medical or anything that they're missing that's contributing to the um, sleep problems. And so reiterating a little bit what Alex said, people sometimes think about sleep and coming and seeing me and think, oh, they must have a sleep study. Where it's an actual fact, the majority of kids don't need a sleep study. But I think one of the things that we can do is examine the child and go through all the medical complaints and then reassure parents that their child is healthy and then help hopefully move forward so that then they can enact uh, upon some of the behavioural strategies that are suggested. In terms of accessing services, I mean sleep studies are a limited resource in children. They're very labour intensive, equipment intensive and um, most capital cities have access to a sleep lab but they have very long waiting times and Tasmania doesn't have a dedicated lab, Northern Territory doesn't. But I think a sleep study isn't magic and sometimes people think, oh, you have to have a sleep study to proceed, whereas in actual fact, I, I don't think you do. Um, in terms of the um, things like restless legs, you know, I'll take a dietary history, I'll start children on iron. In terms of snoring, if I feel it's obstructive sleep apnea, then sometimes I start treating with intranasal steroids or I'll get an ENT assessment. I'll sort of start treatment while setting in place a supportive behavioural program. And I think that's the only other thing I'd like to raise is that particularly with children with developmental disabilities, you know, sleep out there's got this reputation of sleep problem equals control crying. And it's, it's really hard to dispel that. And I think you can set in place more supportive, gradual programs that gradually change behaviour. Um, and we're not very good at conveying that. So that would be one thing I'd really emphasise. Thanks, Margot. Uh, Amanda, such a crucial role in, uh, in, in non-pharmacological uh, uh, approaches to the management of a case like uh, of Georgie's. Do you want to comment on the perspective of a psychologist and how a psychologist may uh, become uh, involved and, and collaborate uh, effectively with other clinicians uh, in management? Well, I, I think as I, I outlined, you, you, the psychologist really needs to be aware of potential medical contribution to children's sleep problems and, and to refer. They also, if they they don't think there's a medical um, issue happening from their history. They may start with a, a behavioural intervention in conjunction with the family and there are a number of approaches. And interestingly, whilst many parents don't like extinction or, or controlled crying, we have actually found that many parents of children on the autism spectrum do use this successfully because they're very used to using behavioural type interventions with their children because it forms part of the intervention that the child's generally having during the day and they can do a good job of it, but you need to provide them with a lot of support if they are going to. And if they don't like to do that, there are a lot of other kinds of gradual approaches and more gentle approaches so that, that the psychologist, that we don't have time to talk to that, that the psychologist can use to, to do right. that. Um, so if the psychologist finds though that they didn't think there was a medical problem and but their behavioural interventions aren't working, they also need to be aware that maybe there's something else going on that they've missed and they do need to consider um, writing to the, keeping the GP informed and, and sending the parents back to the GP with, um, with a message, uh, with, with a report and asking for a referral to someone like Marco. Yes. I think that's Thanks. really important to know that you really should think about the fact that you can't handle it all yourself. Yes. Thanks so much, Amanda. And uh, Sue, 
uh, from an OT perspective, Sue. So just final concluding mm -hmm. remarks. Yeah, well, from, from the point of view of collaboration, I think that two-way street is crucial. So certainly, often we find ourselves saying to the families, speak to your doctor, have you told your doctor about this, your paediatrician, your neurologist, your GP, that's one point. But equally, I think it's really important for all of us, if we're looking at interventions, particularly around behaviour, communication, those kind of strategies, find out what's already happening with the child therapy team. There may be some really specific, sophisticated, really targeted strategies in place already for the child through school, through the therapy team. It would be counterproductive in fact to not communicate with those teams, find out what they're doing and how they're doing it. If, all, if, if we can harness those teams, they can in fact be a big part of the sleep picture. Maybe they don't realise it, but they can. So I would really stress, make sure we link in with services that the child already see, receiving across all their environments. Mm. Thanks so much, Sue. Uh, so I, I really, I want to thank all of the panelists tonight for, I mean, we have an absolutely stellar uh, group of uh, clinicians uh, in the panel tonight that have given us a shared, you know, fa you know fascinating perspectives on, on this really complex uh, case study. So I, I really thank you all uh, uh, for your contributions. So we've seen tonight that this is indeed the case of Georgie it raises a number of complex issues that really need a multidisciplinary approach, both in uh, you know diagnosis and in management. Amanda put it very nicely that the clinicians really need to understand uh, that you know the the, the two-way uh, street in this referral process, the critical role that the GP plays, and understanding where another discipline, another health professional, uh, needs to come in. We see clearly in this example of Georgie that sleep is of fundamental importance and it can have a significant impact both uh, on, and in the child in terms of their uh, nighttime behaviours, their daytime behaviours, as well as a significant impact on the family. And so I, I think that this case study tonight has highlighted uh, the critical role that sleep plays uh, in, 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 in normal functioning uh, in, in a child. I want to uh, remind you all uh, to complete the exit survey before you log out. Uh, it'll appear on the screen as the session closes uh, and certificates for attendance for this webinar will be issued in four to five weeks. Um, each participant will be sent a link to online resources associated with this webinar. We have great resources available and I thank the panel members uh, for drawing attention uh, to some wonderful recent resources that have come out. So you're gonna get a, a set of rich resources to really support the uh, discussion tonight. Uh, a reminder about the next webinar that's coming as well. And I'm asked to really encourage you all to consider setting up uh, your own special interest network exploring autism and sleep disturbance. Clearly there was a lot of interest in the uh, webinar tonight. I can see from your comments as well that there's much to be gained from sharing information with one another. So we really encourage you uh, to set up this uh, special interest network uh, for those of you who are interested. So thank you again for your attention. Thank you to the panel members and thank you to the audience for joining us tonight. Uh, uh, we look forward to seeing you again for the next webinar. Thank you.